Hey Rock Buddies, it's Papa. Hope you're doing well today. Today I'm going to tell you the story of potassium feldspar and its long, long, incredible journey through both space and time to become included in a variety of interesting sedimentary and metamorphic rock types. So, I hope you enjoy this video. If you do, give me a thumbs up and subscribe. So here we go. We're starting our amazing potassium feldspar adventure with a rock called granite, which many of you are familiar with. This is a piece of granite rock and those big rectangular hunks of mineral are, you guessed it, potassium feldspar mostly. There are other minerals in there, but the big ones are potassium feldspar. So, potassium feldspar comes from granite. That's its main source. That's where it comes into the uh, land crust of the world and gets its start. So, where does granite come from? Well, granite is an intrusive igneous rock, and when continents crash, when subduction of ocean crust happens beneath a continent, as in the case of the Taconic mountain building event, and the Acadian mountain building event, or when two giant continents crash, as in the Alleghenian mountain event, granite is produced in mass. Uh, rock, the, the, the rock of the land crust is melted and reforms as granite plutons. Also subducting ocean crust goes deep down in, uh, toward the mantle and melts and the lightweight, low melting point magma rises up and forms granite. All the granite is emplaced deep underground, the roots of the mountains. But over many millennium, many millions of years, erosion occurs and exposes the granite to the surface where erosion takes place. How about this rock? It's very similar to granite. It's a metamorphic version of granite and it's called granite gneiss. See all the white and pinkish mineral in there? You guessed it, that's more potassium feldspar. So granite gneiss comes from metamorphosed granite. And feldspar, especially potassium feldspar, mostly originates in granite rock. How can I tell this is a metamorphic rock? Because of the swirls. Metamorphism takes this and heats it, puts it under pressure and heats it into a plastic state. The light minerals uh, come together and the dark minerals come together in swirls and you got metamorphic granite. Here's a piece of potassium feldspar and you may remember from another video that potassium feldspar has a flashy face. So here's that flashy face, potassium feldspar. That's a good way to identify a big hunk of it. In a rock like granite, you probably won't see the flashy face, but you will see a white mineral, and that will be feldspar. In granite and granite nice, most of that feldspar is potassium feldspar. So what does potassium feldspar have in it? What are the elements it has in it? There you go, potassium feldspar has silicon, oxygen, aluminum, and potassium. Silicon plus oxygen is what? Right, quartz. So quartz plus aluminum and potassium. That gives you potassium feldspar. So how did this, the potassium feldspar get pulled out of granite and granite gneiss and pushed down into the streams? Well, once a granite or granite gneiss pluton gets close to the surface of the ground uh, by the process of weathering and erosion where the material on top is removed, rainwater from up above and organic and inorganic chemicals begin to work on the rock. And they pull the potassium feldspar out and turn it into clay. And this is a sample of good old Georgia red clay that has been uh, chemically weathered out from the Elberton granite pluton. 
once the uh, clay is formed and the uh, upper layers of the soil are eroded off of it, uh, then rain can work on it and pick up pieces of the clay and uh, pull them down into the streams where they can begin their long trip to the sea. Now, another way that the feldspar comes out of the granite and granite gneiss is if the granite and granite gneiss rock itself is exposed at the surface, for example, like Stone Mountain in Georgia or even the places where the Elberton, uh, Georgia granite batholith is exposed to the surface. One of the places that clay goes to and builds up in is at the end of the river where the river dumps out into the ocean. And here we can see the, the mainland on the right and then there's a long slender barrier island on the left. In between the mainland and the barrier island is the sound and that's where much mud accumulates. Here's that same mud filled sound between the barrier island and the mainland. Now let's suppose the ocean level goes down uh, during a period of glaciation where all the ocean water is sucked up into ice sheets. Well then you get a swamp there like the Okefenokee Swamp and the clay that accumulates in a swamp like this if it's later on buried under uh, layers of sand and other sediments can turn into an interesting kind of clay called kaolinite. Here's a picture of kaolinite clay from the area of Sandersville, Georgia, along the uh, fall line, where there are lots of kaolin mines that were former uh, swamp areas. And uh, kaolinite is made out of quartz plus aluminum plus water. This picture is a side view of what the continental shelf on the edge of the land looks like. The red at the bottom is the plasticky molten mantle, the brown is the land crust, which is mostly granite and granite nice. The orange is a layer of sand, the very narrow bluish gray is a layer of mud, and the pink is a layer of limey mud, which will turn into limestone. Uh, and this is what the edge of the continent looks like, this is called the continental shelf. On the very far left you have the sand beaches, which is the orange part. And then out a little way from the sand beaches, you have a layer of mud because the very fine particles uh, can be carried further out by the water that's coming out of rivers. And it's deposited as a layer of mud out on top of the sand. And then even further out, there are coral reefs and um, other shell creatures that create with the death of their bodies, a limey kind of mud. So you can see there's a tremendous amount of mud surrounding the edge of the continent on the continental shelf. We're just beginning on our Velspar journey through time and space, which includes metamorphism. In the next video, I'm gonna show you the rocks that Velspar clay turns into and how they are affected by the forces of metamorphism. We will look at examples. Okay, see you in the next video. Papa out.